Our class this evening assumes that the uh, first principles concerning devils, demons, unclean spirits, Satan, etc. are already understood. And so we won't be proving that supernatural powers in opposition to God don't exist. That's not our aim this evening. So what is our aim? Well, our aim is to discover within the scriptures guiding principles which will help us to understand why the inspired records use the language of devils, demons and unclean spirits in relation to some miracles of healing. And probably, mostly from now on, I'm going to use the the phrase demonic language to cover the whole of our subject title. Otherwise, it's going to get a little bit repetitious, isn't it? Devils, demons, unclean spirits. For simplicity, I'm going to use the label demonic language. So how are we going to do this this evening? Well, I want to kind of divide the class into roughly two parts that will be roughly equal length. And I hope to goodness that I've not bitten off more than I can chew. Now, the first part, unusually for me, will not turn up many scriptures. And normally I'm the first to complain when that's the case. But hopefully as I go through, you'll see why that's the case. We're going to keep some pretty high level. We're going to refer to a number of scriptures. uh, But really, it's food for thought. Uh, And, you know, feel free to make notes and uh, talk to me about it afterwards if if I go off piste a little. So that's the first part. We're going to... Ask the question, why? Why is demonic language used in the Gospels? And then having drawn out some principles which are very much founded within the Scriptures, we're then going to try and apply them to just one miracle, that the record of which uses this demonic language. And it's the record that we just read with Brother Chris in Mark chapter 1 there. Um, we, we just read the section verses 14 to 28. So that's what I hope to do, and then we'll have a few summary points at the end. So the first part. The question is that we're thinking about why. Why is demonic language used in the Gospels? And it is an important question, and there are several facets to the, to the answers, and there are more than one possible answer. But before we start with those, I want to just frame our thinking. I want you to uh, realise that if we go through all three Gospels, or all four Gospels actually, but particularly the Synoptic Gospels, we'll find that the demonic language is used in, in certainly Matthew, Mark and Luke. It isn't specific to just one record, it spans all three. So that's the first point I want you to notice. And the second thing I want you to, to, um, to do is to imagine something for me. Now arguably having a PowerPoint slide or something similar would have been useful here but I haven't. Um, We won't unpack the reasons why. Uh, We just haven't got one. So you're going to need to imagine this table, and it's a really useful table, okay? So can you imagine it? You can always scribe it down if you you, you need to look at something. But it's a simple table with three columns, okay? On your first column, so your left, you're going to write down what the miracle was. You're just going to note what is the miracle, column one. In the second column, You're going to put, is demonic language used, yes or no? And in the third column, you're going to say, where did the miracle take place? So just imagine that that table exists and you've then gone through all of the gospel records and you've done that simple exercise. What was the miracle of healing in particular? What was the miracle? Was demonic language used in the record of the healing? And where did that miracle take place? Where geographically did it take place? Now, having done that that wonderful analysis uh, and you've got it all there, these would be your results. Now, you're going to have to believe me, you're going to have to trust me. But if you are in doubt, do the exercise for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. Uh, But for the purposes of the class, do, because it will help us uh, go through this quickly. So the first of three patterns that would become evident are this. The first pattern is that we would note that only sometimes demonic language is used. Sometimes it is definitely not used and sometimes it is a bit ambiguous. That's the first pattern. The second pattern is that there is a correlation between the type of miracle and the use of demonic language. So certain types of miracle commonly use demonic language or frequently used demonic language. 
And the third pattern is that there is a correlation between where geographically the healing miracle takes place and the use of demonic language. So there's three patterns, and we're going to go through each one now briefly in turn to unpack them in a bit more detail. So the, pattern, the first pattern was that sometimes demonic language is used, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's ambiguous. So let me explain. In the healing of the man in the synagogue from our reading in Mark 1, which is probably still open on your laps, you would agree with me that demonic language is clearly used. Unequivocally. There are the spirit of the unclean demon in the Luke record. It is a devil. Okay, so there it is clear. It is used. But in the healing of the blind man in Mark 8, the language of demons, spirits, unclean spirits, devils, etc. is not used. So in Mark 8, when the blind man is healed, that language is not used. But there are other miracles which is not so straightforward. So, for example, later on in this chapter in Mark 1, around about verse 30, you read of Simon Peter's mother, uh, or mother-in-law rather, his wife's mother, who lay sick of a fever. And if you read through that uh, record, it says that the fever left her. Okay? A bit ambiguous, isn't it? And it's very similar to what's used of the nobleman's son in John 4, which is also says that the fever left him. And this language is ambiguous because, um, uh, sorry, the fever is rebuked in Mark 1, the fever leaves the nobleman's son in John 4. This language of being rebuked or leaving is also applied to other miracles that do use devils, demons and unclean spirits. Those things are said to have left the individual or they are said to have been rebuked. By the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what I mean by ambiguous. It's not always cut and dry whether or not the language is used. So that's the pattern. What's the conclusion of that pattern, the first pattern? Well, I think there are two possible conclusions from this first pattern of evidence. Number one, the inspired records do not constantly apply demonic language to all miracles of healing. Other language is used to easily describe miracles of healing without the need for demonic language. And the Gospels, therefore, do not rely on demonic language to convey miracles of healing. That's an important point. I'm going to say it again. The Gospel records do not rely on demonic language to convey miracles of healing. And the second conclusion from the first pattern is that the ambiguous language helps us to realise... Um, that it is synonymous with the healing itself, okay? We can conclude that the use of demonic language is therefore used symbolically. It helps to convey a message over and above the healing itself. So there are two conclusions there which I think are helpful. Now the second pattern from this table that you've done, and you've got all this analysis, what was the miracle? Was demonic language used uh, and where did the miracle take place? The second pattern then is that you suddenly realise that there are certain types of miracles that use the demonic language quite frequently. In particular, demonic language is used consistently in relation to miracles of healing associated with the brain. And more specifically, it's used with healings that are associated with neurological conditions. And, the, and, and alongside that pattern, it's a sort of the other side of the coin, demonic language is rarely, if ever, used in relation to miracles of healing of other, perhaps we might say, non-neurological conditions. Other such miracles of healing, that language isn't used. So, for example, the man in the synagogue in Mark 1 seems to have suffered with the symptoms commonly associated with epilepsy. He was torn, couldn't control himself. Epilepsy, we, we think, Mark 1. The man, the Gadarene man that's recorded in all three Gospels, seems to have suffered with symptoms of something like a multiple personality disorder. And that may or may not have been caused by a parasite. And we can speculate and we can be interested in the symptoms that are described. And then the dumb man in Matthew 9, uh, well, that man may have suffered from any number of neurological conditions, but the one that, that springs to mind uh, is a stroke. Okay? So... Those kind of miracles, those miracles that are associated with the brain or, or maladies of the brain, very commonly, very frequently use demonic language. But other miracles, like the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead, the man with the withered hand, the man born blind, these miracles, well, they don't use 
demonic language. So that's the, the second pattern, okay? There is a correlation between the type of miracle of healing and whether or not this language is used. And what's the conclusion we can draw from that then? Well, I'm going to suggest that we can conclude that demonic language is used in relation to miracles of healing that are associated with the brain because the record of these miracles are used to symbolize, symbolize uh, and, and to represent teaching about the mind. Okay? These miracles of healings that are healing neurological conditions, conditions affecting the brain, use demonic language because it is a symbol, it is a vehicle by which the, gospel, the, the inspired word is able to convey a teaching that goes beyond just that person being healed. It's about a battle for the mind. So that's the second pattern. And the third pattern that I think emerges from that table is that there is a correlation between where the miracle takes place, so the geographical location for the miracle, and whether or not demonic language is used. Now, the miracles of healing that use demonic language all take place in the north of the land of Israel, especially in the region of Galilee, and in particular in the city of Capernaum. Now, that's not to say that all miracles that took place in the north of Israel, in and around Galilee, not all of those miracles used demonic language because they do not. In fact, the raising of Jairus' daughter took place in Capernaum, but as we've already said, demonic language is not used. So it's not okay to draw the conclusion that if the miracle happened in, in Galilee or in and around Galilee, they used demonic language. That would be a false conclusion, okay? But there is a correlation between the two. But there is a within that correlation still an important distinction being made. And I think that distinction is being made for a reason. So what conclusion might we draw from this third pattern of evidence? Well, I think it goes something like this. That demonic language is used in relation to some healing miracles that take place in the north of the land of Israel, in and around Galilee, where there is a backdrop of Gentile beliefs associated with devils, demons and unclean spirits. Beliefs which, if you were interested, the secular sources, secular literature shows us that uh, those beliefs were pagan in origin. And I think that we can conclude from this that the scriptures use and reflect those widespread beliefs of the Gentiles in that region to teach doctrine. And when we look at the example in Mark 1 in a little while, I hope to show you that Jesus uses this demonic language in this very Galilee region to reflect these demonic beliefs, to teach Israel and us, by extension, important lessons about the need for the true worship of the God of Israel. So let's summarise what we've done in the last 10 minutes or so. I think we've established... I hope we've established four principles, and I think they are important principles. The first is that the inspired scriptures do not always apply demonic language to all miracles of healing. Other language is used easily to describe the miracles of healing without the need for demonic language. The scriptures are not bound by the belief of the day to always reflect this sense that, that somebody was possessed by a devil, demon, or unclean spirit. It's able to to, to convey those miracles of healing without that language at all. So the question is, well, why does it use it then? And we are suggesting, uh, uh, well, it leads us to, to a second conclusion, that it's, it's there used as a symbol. That is a level of symbology that's used, a, a vehicle by which teaching can be made uh, in addition to the healing itself. And the third is that the, the ambiguous use of language in some cases indicates to us that the demonic language is synonymous with the healing itself. We are not to, to be led astray by the scriptures. The scriptures don't confuse us. They don't lie to us. They are there to show us almost the synonym. If it describes an unclean spirit or an unclean devil or an unclean demon, and then in, in another way it talks about it being a fever being rebuked or a fever leaving an individual, then really it's just the healing. Okay, it is a healing of the malady, but in one, the frame of reference of this demonic language is used, in others, 
it is not. So it just shows us that it is still just the healing that's being talked about. And I think the fourth principle is that there is an element of the way in which the scriptures reflect the widespread yet regional Gentile false beliefs. Again, to teach doctrine. So that's, I think, a helpful starting point. You've done that analysis, you've gone through a whistle-stop tour, we've drawn out some conclusions, and we're going to use those conclusions to move on to the, the next stage of our, of our class. So we're still thinking about this question, aren't we? Well, why? Why is demonic language used in the Gospels? And if we were to try and write the answer down, I think, and you were to, to sort of talk to people about this, there are, that I've come across, two commonly held viewpoints uh, in answer to this question. Now, I'm going to tell you, before I give you the two viewpoints, I don't think either are right. Okay? But I'm going to share them with you anyway, so that you can go with me on this journey uh, of learning. Okay? So the first viewpoint, if somebody says to you, well, why is demonic language used? You might hear this answer. You're very likely to hear one of these two answers. The first is that Jesus and the apostles mentioned demons because they believe they existed. And since they were inspired, devils, demons and unclean spirits are part of the supernatural world. Now, you might be surprised at that one. Now, we're not going to dwell on this particular answer for very long because um, it is problematic when compared to many other scriptures. It's also a very literalistic viewpoint which does not allow for this role of symbology within the miracles, okay? So, uh, but it is a, a view that's held. But the, the second you may well have heard of. So the alternative view goes along the lines that Jesus and the apostles were people of their time. They were people of their day. They did not understand. Perhaps they could not have understood, goes the suggestion, disease and illness in scientific terms. And so they understood these things in the concepts that were familiar to them and that were familiar to the people around them. Just think about that one for a minute, okay? This is held commonly that Jesus and the apostles were people of their time. They did not understand and perhaps could not have understood disease and illness in scientific terms that we do today. And so they understood them in concepts like devils, demons and unclean spirits that were familiar to them and that were certainly familiar to the people around them. Now, I have to be really clear. This view is not in accordance with our shared understanding of the inspiration of scriptures. God is the author of these gospel records, and as he is of all the scriptures. 2 Peter 1 says, doesn't he, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we know that the scriptures introduce many concepts and ideas to those who were inspired with the words themselves. And these concepts and ideas were sometimes not understood by the writers themselves. Okay, God gives them concepts, visions, prophecies that were mind-bending to them, that they were hard to be understood. And so he could easily have revealed these things to them in scientific terms, but God chose not to. Therefore, the idea that neurological conditions couldn't have been understood by the men and women of Christ's day that just doesn't sit well with me, brothers and sisters. We have no evidence that these people were primitive. And it also risks, I think, tarring the Son of God with the same limited understanding. So, having told you the two views and why I think that they are both wrong, okay, I don't believe that Jesus or the apostles believed in devils, demons and unclean spirits. The apostles may have done when they were first converted, and there is evidence, which we aren't going to explore this evening, where it appears to develop their understanding. But I never believe for one minute that the Lord Jesus Christ believed in these things. And yet, the fact remains that he uses these terms in his miracles of healing. So the question still remains, why? And I think the answer, I think the viewpoint that is uh, correct is that there are several reasons why demonic language is used, and those three, th those reasons are encompassed under three broad categories. Okay, I think the reason demonic language is used is because one, that was terminology of the day. It's just what things were called. 
There is an element of accommodation, and we'll explain what we mean by that in a second. But more important in all those uh, two is symbology. That devils, demons, and unclean spirits are used as symbols in Scripture to make some really exciting points and some really exciting teaching. So what do we mean by terminology? Well, terminology just, just is a word that says that's what things are called. They are the terms. And when a condition, particularly a medical condition, um, is first sort of encountered or, or sort of commonly encountered, um, the name that's given to it quite often sticks. And there are a few go-to examples of this. Malaria is the one we're going to think about. But influenza, being influenced by the heavenly bodies or the stars. Dengue fever is another example. Malaria. So let's just unpack that one for, for a second. It's from the Latin terms mal, meaning bad, or mala, meaning bad, and aria, meaning air. Malaria, it means bad air. And that's because when this uh, term was coined in the mid-19th century, the belief was that malaria, bad air, uh, was the reason um, why people got sick with this particular condition. It's to do with the decomposition smells and the gases in, in, these mar in the marshes, and uh, these marshes, um, if you lived near these marshes, then you quite often got sick with this condition. It was called malaria. And actually, we now know that it's a parasite carried by a mosquito that causes malaria. And yet, what do we call it? If you need to go abroad to an area that's got malaria, it is still called malaria. But do any of you believe that the condition was caused by bad air? Of course you don't. You see the point? So although these conditions were said unclean spirit, devil or demon, there is a facet by which this is just the terminology. It's just what it was called. But can we rightly conclude that Jesus and the apostles believed it in the way that we, we, we sometimes talk about it? No, I don't, think we, I don't think we can. So that's terminology. The second is accommodation. What do we mean by accommodation? This idea of accommodating certain beliefs. Well, if a person thinks that they are possessed by a devil or demon, it is impossible, I suggest, to tell them that they aren't. It's sometimes necessary for clinicians who deal with people, with, with patients suffering conditions of the mind, take multiple personality disorder, for example, where they can be any number of personalities and they can change in split seconds. They can be wholly different personas. And the personas can know about each other. They can be uh, completely different in type and character. And sometimes a clinician needs to start by saying, well, who am I dealing with today? Who is it? And they have different names sometimes. Now, the clinician needs to accommodate that person's belief sense to even to get a conversation going from which you can then build a basis by which you might treat them and help them, contain them. Sometimes these things can be very violent personalities. So that's what we mean by accommodating. In that scenario that I've just painted, the clinician doesn't believe in the world view of, this, of the person that's poorly, but they have to engage with them on those terms to a certain degree. They need to accommodate them to a certain degree in order to communicate with them, to help them, to treat them. So the way in which these miracles of healing are recorded, careful reading will, will show you that whenever Jesus is said to have addressed a devil or demon, the very same verse or a couple of verses later, it's very clear that he's also talking to the individual themselves. So if I was thought I was possessed by a devil or demon, and it's the devil or demons that are speaking through me, Jesus talks to the devil or demon. But then in the next verse, it's very clear he's also talking to me as an individual. You see the point? This is what we mean by accommodation. There is an element of this going on in some of the way in which some of these miracles are recorded. But we can't conclude from that that the Lord Jesus Christ believed in devils, demons or unclean spirits. That doesn't make sense. Now I think it is also too helpful to think about the way in which the prophet Elijah is taunting the children of Israel on Mount Carmel. Do you remember this? There's a great contest going on between the, the, the prince of devils, Baal, and the true God. And the majority of the people there are convinced in the false god Baal, such that this is a contest between the two gods. No contest, we might say. But he says to them, when they've tried all day to get Baal to re respond by fire, Elijah says to them, well, maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's sleeping. He accommodates their worldview He's taunting them, yes, but he's trying to also make them realise 
the craziness of what they're doing, the craziness of their own beliefs. But when Elijah uses those terms, he accommodates their own understanding and reflects it back to them. He's doing it not because he believes in these things, but he's doing it to make a broader point. And we know the outcome of of what happens on Mount Carmel. So that's what we mean by accommodation. It's allowing for a false understanding, either of the, the poorly person themselves, either of some of the audience that were there. But then it's used as a springboard to go on to, uh, to, to develop teaching. And that's where the third element comes in. And the most important of all three is symbology. If you doubt anything that I've said so far, that's fine. But symbology, I really need you to come with me on this one. Symbology is so important because it really does unlock all of the miracles of healing that use demonic language. Devils, demons and unclean spirits, they are not literal. Jesus and his disciples, I suggest, did not believe that they were real. But these miracles are about healing the poorly brains of people. But they go on and they teach doctrine. They teach a spiritual lesson about the battle for the mind. That God is interested in the minds of true disciples, of true, dis- of true believers. He wants our minds to be focused on him and not on anything else. Not on idolatry. And the language of devils, demons and unclean spirits is used in this sense. And it's used in many times in the Old Testament to describe idolatry, to describe idol worship. The false gods from the nations that were around Israel at the time. And Jesus had the power to cure these brain conditions. But more than that, the point that is made by these miracles is that he had the words of God which would help the people leave their idolatry behind them. And instead, focus their minds on Jesus and on the Father. Now, when we say symbology, what do we mean by it? We know what a symbol is, don't we? It's something, a word or phrase that stands for something else in addition to what it is usually used for. So, sun and moon, they describe the celestial bodies. Nine times out of ten in the Bible, when you read about the sun and the moon, you are looking about the sun and the moon that you can see in the daytime if it's not cloudy and in the nighttime uh, if it's not cloudy. So the sun and the moon. But sometimes they are used as a symbol and they are used to represent powers, particularly ruling powers or ruling authorities. So it is a phrase or a word that has an additional meaning into what it is usually understood to be. And I think that's what is going on with this demonic language. Yes, society, particularly in the Gentile region around Galilee, there is a reflection of these false beliefs. But then they are used as a symbol to represent something far more worrying than a brain condition that could be healed by the Almighty. A condition of idolatry that was a pandemic in the nation, that was undermining their whole livelihood. And that ultimately would lead to them being, the natural branches being broken off and and the Gentiles being grafted in. So demonic language reflects both the beliefs uh, of those around them as well as symbolising the nation of Israel under the influence of foreign ideas. So we've covered the first half of the class and I think if I check my stopwatch we've done it in 24 minutes. That's going to be a long class. So we're going to have to have a shorter second half, okay? And if, 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 I've, if, if I get to about 40 minutes or so, I'll just stop in. You don't need to worry. Um, you can have the rest in discussion afterwards if you're interested. So we're now going to go into Mark chapter 1 and we're going to try and see how some of these things stack up, okay? So let's open our Bibles. We're going to do some thumbing and I think we're going to do some me just reading out the references and you listen uh, and then you can look them up in your own time okay so mark 1 verse 21 we're told that uh, on the sabbath day jesus enters into the synagogue and taught you know that and verse 22 that the people are astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority so this miracle begins with jesus entering into a synagogue and teaching with authority and interestingly the teaching is not described for us okay But what is described is the healing of a man with an unclean spirit. And the man with the unclean spirit declares that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Jesus rebukes him and the unclean spirit comes out of the man. And as we might expect, the onlookers are amazed. They're astonished. But somewhat counterintuitively, the Gospels emphasise their amazement, not at the miracle, but at the doctrine that Jesus taught rather than the miracle that he carried out. You see that? 
Verse 22, they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority. And in verse 27, at the end of that miracle, we've got a mirror image, haven't we? They were all amazed, inasmuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, what new thing is this, what new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. So we've got teaching in a synagogue, teaching not recorded, miracle done, miracle done with unclean spirit. The people are amazed, but they're not amazed at the doctrine. They're not amazed at the miracle. They're amazed at the doctrine because repeated doctrine and authority. So there is a real clear pattern to this miracle, and this is emphasising the symbology that's going to go on here. The teaching happens within the miracle of healing itself. So this is a chiastic structure for those that like finding these. In verse 21, we have a mirror uh, with verse 29. Uh, They go into the synagogue. Verse 29, they come out of the synagogue. Uh, In verse 23, we learn that the man with the unclean spirit confronts Jesus and we are told that he cried out. And in verse 26, the counterpart, the unclean spirit, tears the man and he cries out with a loud voice. So we've got crying out. We've got unclean spirit, 23 and 26. And that then leads us to the centre of this miracle, which is also the centre of the chiasm. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. So clearly this miracle, the way in which it is recorded, is really important. And we have to remember that as well with everything else we've said this evening, that the the world couldn't contain the books of everything that Jesus did. So the miracles that are recorded are are of particular interest. And therefore the ones that do use demonic language are another level of interest beyond that, aren't they? Why this miracle? Why record it in this way? It's not just okay to say, well, it, it conveys the general sense that Jesus could heal people. Well, you could do that without this level of detail, brothers and sisters. There must be more to it than that. So the way in which it is recorded is as important as what is recorded. So this miracle puts Jesus in opposition to the man possessed with an unclean spirit, and it demonstrates a conflict between the unclean spirit and Christ. Okay. Now, you might want to note here that when you get the the parallel record in Luke, Rather than unclean spirit, we have the word demon. And that's why I think we can use them interchangeably. As to why we have the three terms, well, that will have to be another class altogether. But there is a degree of interchangeability. And I think the reason there are differences lie in the fact that there are different symbols being used and different facets of idolatry that are being brought out in the Old Testament. So let's just park that for a moment and let's think about uncleanness unclean spirit it's very clear in mark 1 that is what's described an unclean spirit uncleanness in the law through moses had involved several things you had unclean animals which the israelites were not allowed to touch and if they did they had to make a sin offering leviticus 5 there were unclean animals which could not be eaten leviticus 11 the state of leprosy was described as being unclean leviticus 13 and bodily discharges were also unclean leviticus 12 and Leviticus 15. So the law has a lot to do with uncleanness. It was not a good thing. The general result of transgressing these laws meant that a person themselves became styled unclean and action had to be taken to resolve the situation. And that usually involved a period of separation. And this whole idea of uncleanness, that whole pattern of what's in the law, you become, you touch something unclean, you associate with it, you yourself are unclean, you have to be separated. This then becomes a, a pattern to describe the native inhabitants of the land given to Israel. So just listen to Ezra 9, okay? Ezra 9, the land unto which ye go to possess is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to the other with their uncleanness so we've got the law we've got a pattern of uncleanness and already that pattern is used elsewhere in the old testament to associate it with gentiles with their filthiness with their uncleanness and in particular their idolatry their abominations ezra 9 verse 11 that was and in ezekiel 36 we have a very similar reference it says son of man when the house of israel dwelt in their own land they defiled it by their own way 
and by their doings their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore I poured out my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon their land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. That's Ezekiel 36 verses 17 and 18. And it goes on to say in, in Ezekiel 36 that having been polluted and having been unclean Ezekiel 36 verse 25 says then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from your from all your idols will I cleanse you so do you see what's going on here we've got literal uncleanness as according to the law we've got that being used as a pattern for what happened to Israel when they came into contact with these false ideas of the nations around them they were unclean they were filthy. They needed to be cleansed from their idolatry. And God promises a faithful remnant. He would reverse their state of uncleanness and he would make them clean. And I, Zechariah 13, let's just have a look at Zechariah 13 because this reference is a good go-to reference in this subject. Zechariah 13 and verse 2. Talking about the way in which God is going to redeem the remnant. Zechariah 13 verse 2. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith Yahweh of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I'll cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. You see that? Zechariah 13 and verse 2. And so when we're thinking about symbology, rather than being bogged down with what's going on in Mark 1, with did Jesus believe in unclean spirits or did he not? Were they clever enough to understand the science or were they not? Let's be faithful to the record. Let's realise that it's teaching doctrine. And that there are those within the audience of Jesus' day that understood the doctrine. And they marvel because he's teaching with authority. And the unclean spirit that is being styled here is representative of the state of the nation of Israel who were themselves unclean, who needed the uncleanness to be cast out. But they needed the cleaning, as it were, the cleansing of Almighty God that was possible in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are able to comprehend better what's going on in Mark chapter 1. If we stand too close to that record, we end up seeing the gospel as a product of its day. Strange demonic language being used to describe to us recognisable neurological conditions. Which are to do with some form of brain impairment of one form or another. But by stepping back from that very close up narrative and considering the record in the light of the canon of scripture, which God so clearly wants us to do time and again, comparing spiritual with spiritual, we see that we begin to see a symbology that goes well beyond the literal explanation of what was wrong with the poorly man. And I think my point is simple, that rather than being caught up in what the condition might have been, we do that sometimes, don't we? Oh, what was it? Was it epilepsy or was it, was it something else? That, brothers and sisters, is not, not the important bit. It might be interesting. You know, was the man, the Gadarene, was he affected by cystic psychosis? Had he ate, eaten and cooked pork? Was he a sufferer of a parasite? That's fascinating, but it's not the main point. The main point is the way in which God wants us to realise that there is a symbology well beyond the miracle of healing itself. That it's to, to do with the spiritual state of the nation of Israel. And the healer was, was possible to, to heal these things. You know, we're familiar with this concept. The man with the withered hand, many of you will know this one. He, it's on a Sabbath day. Is it to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy and Jesus puts the man in front of him and says, stretch forth your hand on the Sabbath day. And you go back to Isaiah 58, which is all about the key principles of the Sabbath. And how does Isaiah 59 verse 1 begin? Behold, Yahweh's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. So we're used to seeing Old Testament principles being worked out in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Key principles of salvation being brought out in real life. And I think the miracles of, of healing to do with demonic language are the same. We are being encouraged by God to go and find this language in the Old Testament and to use that as the frame of understanding by which we are taught great lessons about the battle for our minds, about the need for us not to be distracted and overwhelmed by, as it were, power, powers that have influence over us, but instead to be clear-minded 
in our right minds, as it says of the Gadarene, and, and, and in, a, in a state of mind that is ready to receive the word of God. Now, we have run out of time. I had hoped to be able to show you much more of this language in Mark 1 in the Old Testament because there is a particular and very specific typology which underlies this miracle. It's that of Israel being spiritually in Israel. Sorry, spiritually in Egypt. Okay? So rather than giving you all of the types, I'm going to just pick out one or two. Okay? So the man with the unclean spirit, the words that he cries are important. He says, let us alone. And that's exactly what the people say to Moses in Exodus 14. Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. I'll give you these references afterwards. I just want to give you a quick bullet point summary so you go, I think you could be onto something there. Okay? Let us alone, Exodus 14. Let us alone, why? That we may serve the Egyptians. The man also says, Art thou come to destroy us? That's in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Because Yahweh hated us, he has brought us forth into the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. It is word for word verbatim. Ezekiel 20 implores the people that they had to forsake the idols of Egypt. And then uh, we're told that, um, uh, that, that Jesus told the, the, the man to hold his peace. And that's exactly the phrase that's used in Exodus 14 again. They were told that they would hold their peace when they saw the salvation of Yahweh. It says, Yahweh shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. We're told that the people are amazed in Mark 1. And this amazement is reflected uh, by the amazement of the nations around Israel. Uh, Israel when Israel are delivered from Egypt okay so Exodus 15 the dukes of Edom shall be amazed the mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold on them all the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away so I've just done a handful of the, the comparisons but you can see that every clause of this record every phrase is loaded with meaning it is loaded with association it is loaded with with representation the broad pattern of unclean spirits takes us to idolatry, but the specific language too gives us a very particular context, that of Israel in Egypt and succumbing to the idols of Egypt. Well, I'm going to draw a line under it there. I hope this class has been helpful. I realise I have tried to cram too much into it, um, but I hope that it, the principles, you'll remember the principles, that this is a very carefully constructed record by the almighty God of the heaven and earth. Let's not presume to limit the understanding of our Lord or the understanding of his disciples. Don't patronise them by what they could or could not have understood. Do not limit the creator to what he could convey because of the limited understanding of a group of people in a certain region. Instead, let's see it as reflecting a belief but being used to overturn that belief and to help the nation, not just the one man that was poorly or the one woman that needed help, but through that healing, the nation could realise, whoa, hang on. We too can be saved from the idolatry that is around us if only we will be in our right minds and ready to come to know the true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Thanks, Ian.